are back again with Ben, uh, future co-host, because I'm going to snag him as much as I possibly can. And we were talking about originally some of the age of Scorpio and that he, he believes his theory is that we are living in a wave, a sine wave that goes up and down. And we are in a specific one right now. And he's kind of talking us through that and drawing us a picture um, of that sine wave and, and how basically he believes life is, is progressing and it starts and peaks and goes down and peaks and then comes back again. And if you haven't seen the first episode, make sure you go back. I'll put something at the end of this one so it goes back to the first episode. So, hey, Ben, how's it going? Thank you so much for coming on again. Um, it's, been, it, it's been a really good talk last time, so I'm excited for this one. Oh, yeah. Hey, Sage. It's, uh, it's good to be back. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. So I'm going to kind of jump right into this um, because it's it's a lot of information. So make sure you're all sitting down and kind of listening because it's, it's a lot of information for me. Um, so we kind of went through the age of Scorpio, and um, but you wanted to touch back a little bit on a specific topic, correct? Yeah, um, the uh, the gigantism that was going on during the time. Uh, we we talked about the atmospheric pressure being high, mm -hmm. which caused things to grow big. Uh, but we kind of missed a, a key point there. Like all the animals were growing big, all the plants were growing big. But what about the people? Um, you know, there's this big kind of conspiracy going on of of uh, you know giant skeletons being dug up here and there and and going missing, and we don't have any. Uh, we, we can't seem to find the evidence for it. Right. Um, but obviously, if everything else was growing big, so were humans. Um, and I guess the question then becomes, well, how big were they? Um, and I've heard everything from 25 feet tall, which would be, Ooh. you know, extra ridiculous, to right. probably a good conservative number of maybe about eight or nine feet tall. Um, and there's a lot of reports of that, of, of that type of growth. Everything from like Bigfoot technically down to actually humans that were that tall. Right. And, and the reason uh, you hear about, say, the conspiratorial side where we, let's say, we find a mound somewhere out in the Midwest and, and they dig up a skeleton that's like eight feet tall and then it goes missing. You know, we had <laughs> talked about where everybody lived during that time. Everybody was living on the, uh, the continental shelves. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about, you know, the outliers, the people who maybe just wanted to get away from society and, and live up on the uh, continental highlands. And that's what we're digging up is is those people that were living out there. We're not digging up, you know, the the city of New York that's under four hundred, you know, feet of water. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, their city of New York back in the day where there was, you know, thousands of people. You know, they're sitting under four hundred feet of water on the continental shelf. It's very difficult to get to that. So finding the evidence, um, you know, large scale evidence is is difficult. And as, <clears throat> as I said, and when we do sometimes discussions. Now, if you were to think about that process, right, of being that tall, you would think that the human body would have a gene somewhere in it to allow it to grow that tall also, right, as, it, as evolution type thing. And we see basketball players fairly tall. Um, yeah, we do. There, there is a that. Yeah, there is there is that factor. But I would also say it's what's more important is the environmental factor. Um, do you think a gene you know, would possibly? Um, evolved into the body because of the environmental factor? Is that a possibility? Uh, say that again. So let's say if you got evolution, right, and there's a gene, because of the uh, environmental factor, the body might have created that gene to grow taller. And um, that's possible. And that's as it, possible. you know, just just throwing it out there, like I said, it's just it's it's possibilities, yeah. right? But yeah, go ahead. I, I I would say too that if let's say there was a specific gene that would make somebody taller mm -hmm. in that environment, well, then they would just be taller than everybody else who is taller. <laughs> you know. Oh, that's a good so point. You, you would that's have the basketball point. players of of uh, you know those times. You know, maybe they were the 13, 14 feet tall. You know, right. crazy giant. Right. That's a good point. That's a good point too. See. But yeah, go ahead. So basically, the, the, the so the humans are growing taller, and we're digging them up in the area that they would be taller, <laughs> which basically, yeah. Um, and, and this 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 DNA gene uh, that you're talking about, uh, mm -hmm. this this exists to this day. Um, I, I think I watched a documentary not too long ago talking about. Uh, the people that were growing, you know, eight feet tall. There's there's people eight feet tall out in Africa 
Um, you know, every once in a while here in the United States, we'll get somebody who grows pretty tall. Right. Um, so, so it does exist. Yeah. That is, that's actually interesting because <clears throat> if you think about it, you know, you wonder where some of the stuff comes from. All right. So now, so you've got the environmental factor and, and the basic theory was, okay, you know, like you said, animals are growing. Why would humans not, you know, grow taller also because they, they wouldn't be immune to this. Okay, so where do you where does it go from there? So now we've got the taller humans. Where does it kind of roll from there? Um, well, I would say what happened with um, the bowling ailer rod in the younger dryest period when mm -hmm. whatever happened happened. I know we talked about the sun having a, a micronova event, and that micronova event. <clears throat> um, what I said last time was that it hit the Earth on the north, on the uh, the West. western half of the United, you know, basically where the United States were. Mm -hmm. And uh, what this did, I believe, because of the the evidence that they're digging up about these mammoths, you know, the the heat, the cold, and the asphyxiation, it's possible that this nova event actually crashed into the atmosphere to such an extent that the ground level environment was exposed to space for a brief moment. If you can imagine that. Okay. Um, so if it, you know, something like that were to happen, and then on the other side of the earth where the atmosphere was still, you know, relatively untouched after the event, you know, that atmosphere would have wrapped back around the earth pretty violently to, to kind of equalize, you know, the air pressure. Um, and that could have kicked up a lot of dust, debris, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's all kinds of stuff that could have caused, you know, massive winds. Right. right. Um, but, uh, um, I believe that once that atmosphere left, the environmental conditions for, you know, gigantism kind of left with it. Gotcha. And then so, and, and then at that point, they're, we're also going, uh, well, humans, are not, not us, but they're, they're going underground um, to basically get away from everything that's going on. Yeah. And, and another thing uh, to look at, too, and I don't know, you know, this is just a data point, but if you look at kind of the lifespans of, uh, you know, biblical figures, mm -hmm. um, you kind of look at from the beginning of the Bible towards the end of the Bible, people going from, you know, living, you know, two, three hundred years to, you know, living, you know, basically your, your average 72 year lifespan. Right. So, so it seems that the atmospheric pressure or or something in the environment also caused them to live a long life. Hmm. That's interesting. Also, definitely, definitely interesting. Also. So then, okay. So <clears throat> you've got that the, the atmospheric pressure hit, bearing down, which now the humans are growing taller, and obviously, not obviously, but according to the Bible and stuff, they're living longer. The atmosphere gets basically wiped out in a monstrous. Uh, situation, right? Mm -hmm. And we're now, um, let's say, almost probably rebuilding some other type of atmosphere, you know, so, because where we don't have as much pressure. And now we kind of roll into what stage? Well, we're rolling into the uh, the Holocene um, period at this point. Uh, we we kind of covered the the Golden Age, which was the Reconstruction period. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's when we've got uh, the Belbeck Temple Foundation, uh, the Sphinx, um, possibly the pyramids, too. Um, that's another that's another one in question because it almost looks as if they were all built at the same time. Um, and in fact, it almost looks like they were built at the same time on older ruins that would have existed back then as well. So you've kind of got a reconstruction period on top of maybe what was already constructed during that uh that vedic era that that scorpion era that we were talking about so and then who do you feel uh, doing the reconstruction period basically where you're doing the sphinx and some of that's being argued on how old that actually is we talked a little bit about that uh on the last show um who is actually rebuilding that um that would be the people that went underground um, okay you know there, there was a lot of them um You've got, uh, I imagine they would have had their classes as well, like we do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you've got the higher classes living deeper underground to try to escape whatever uh, whatever was going on. And then you would have had maybe the lower classes living kind of closer to the surface. Hmm. And I believe there, I, I, I'll have to check this and I'll put this in here. There is actually tunnels and underground <clears throat> access to the pyramids, isn't there? I'll have to look that uh, up. 
Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, speculation about some of the catacombs and tunnels underground. In fact, uh, you know, we talked about Dr. Robert Schock after he mm-hmm. uh, was looking at the Sphinx. He he did some, um, I, I believe he went through and did some uh, ground pen- penetrating radar on the, uh, the Giza Plateau and uh, found some things to kind of further, um, you know, uh, further solidify his position on that, um, which is, you know, another reason why today he still says, yeah, it's much older. Wow, that's interesting, too, because that's something that would, you know, kind of also gear towards that um, building of that if they were in that, you know, looking to go underground. All right. So we're, we got the reconstruction period where they're they're building a lot of temples. They're, they're basically rebuilding because they're saying so your thought process is is destruction. And they're like, hey, we should rebuild. And, and build, you know, all these different aspects, you know, the temples and the Sphinx and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we had talked about the, um, well, I don't know if we did talk about, well, we did talk about the uh, the telepathy factor, I believe. Yes. Um, so the old Gaelic order of the Druids talk about this, that a long time ago, all humans uh, communicated exclusively through telepathy. So... Um, if you've still got this telepathic factor going on in the golden age, it would, it would explain the uh, the um, kind of technological leap, you know, from our, our standpoint, when we look at some of these old structures mm-hmm. um, and we look at, you know, how they're putting blocks together and, how, you know, it, it's much more advanced than it should be. And that's that's why I think this reconstruction period was probably pretty quick because, you know, they're going to be a lot more efficient than we are with this telepathy right and telepathy it, when they say that is there mention of just being able to speak or is it more than just that well they said exclusively through telepathy which means they didn't have any need or or want to speak to each other with a language now you know that doesn't that doesn't mean that they weren't you know let's say you know chanting singing mm-hmm. Uh, you know, doing things like that for for whatever reason. But as far as communication with each other, they weren't talking to each other. There wasn't a need for it. And communication, as you know, uh, you know in logistics, is monstrous when it comes to making things move smoother and faster and get things done quicker. Um, oh yeah. So oh yeah. Being able to do that on that. So at at some point though, that goes away. Correct. Yes, and I have been trying to figure out what caused it now. Um, or, or better yet, when it happened, because uh, the, what ha- I watched that video with Ben McBrady. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I encourage everybody to go watch that video. It's on YouTube. Uh, just look up um, The Last Druid. It's an okay. old video. I want to say it was probably made back in the 80s um, okay. of this guy. And he was the last remaining member of the old Gaelic Order of the Druids. And he talks about how the earth fell into the tail of a comet. At some point in the past. Now, when it comes to oral traditions, they're not big on, you know, this happened at this date and this (laughs) happened at this date. They're more or less like, okay, this happened and then this happened and then this happened. Kind of. They're more important. They're more uh, focused on order rather than when. Okay. Um, So, so we really don't know when. But um, when I look at my chart and try to figure it out, there is this point. In history, and this is where we get into the age of cancer, and it's called the 8.2 cold event. Okay. And it happened in 8200 BC. Um, and it was when, you know, this this is after the golden golden age where we are, uh, we're, we're well into uh, the warming period. Mm-hmm. Uh, temperatures are pretty close to what they are today. And all of a sudden, um, the temperatures drop over the next couple of hundred years, uh, probably five, six, seven degree drop. In, in worldwide temperatures. Um, and after this, uh, shortly after this, there's a, uh, <clears throat> let's see, let me make sure I have this, have this correct in the order. Um, so yeah, it drops. And then after this, <clears throat> I call this the, uh, the great historic void between 8200 BC and 5500 BC, where nothing happened. I can't find anything like there's no construction. There's no dating of anything to this period. <clears throat> it's just a mass, vo- a mass void. There's nothing going on. Um, and at some point in the middle of this void, there's another meltwater pulse. Uh, it's meltwater pulse 1C, where there was another 98-foot sea level rise. Um, 
But yeah, at this 8.2 cold event, as soon as this happens, this is basically right at the end of the age of Leo and going into the age of cancer, nothing, no, um, you know, nothing's been dug up and dated to this period. There's no writing. There's no, you know, nothing going on. Uh, so I can only assume that if, you know, the earth fell into the tail of a comet during this period, this would have been the, um, the event that the, uh, oral tradition of the old Gaelic order talks about where we fell into the tail of a comet. And this is where he says that we, that most of humanity, after it was all said and done, uh, most of humanity lost their telepathic ability. Now, um, falling into a comet, like, what do you believe? Um, and I obviously, you, you know, you haven't spoken to, but what do you believe he means by that? I think, well, I, he, he says it pretty clearly. He says the Earth's orbit fell into the tail of a comet. So I guess there was a comet that came through and we just happened to roll right behind it for a period of time. And, uh, you know, if you can imagine, uh, you know, all the ice particles and all the other matter coming off the back of a, um, you know, coming off the back of a comet, I imagine that caused a lot of a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of stuff to happen because they were talking about meteoric impacts and and all kinds of stuff. So it rained down all kinds of chaos. Um, so at this point, they would have got they, they would have gone back underground um, after the Golden Age. Gotcha. OK, so that is like 3000 years. No, uh, 55, 3,000 3, 3, years, correct? You, in that area, that little window? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so for 3,000 years there, we got nothing being, or that you can find, of course. We got nothing being built, and we almost have a work stoppage here. We got a work stoppage going on, you know, bad yeah, weather. <laughs> so, yeah, this ended, this ended the reconstruction period. Uh, and the, the reconstruction period was the age of Leo, and of course, that's you know around 2160, 2160 years of, of reconstruction just ended right then and there. Um, and, and when I say there's nothing going on, uh, I'm mainly talking about well, you know, we're we're talking about the stuff being built, but there's also you know no language at this point. So we just kind of enter into a dark period where there's nothing being constructed. We we still don't have language because there wasn't any before this. Mm -hmm. So it's just a dark period. There's just nothing going on. <clears throat> wow. That's it. All right. So then we've got, so we're rolling to this. And th is this where you believe the earth tilts? Well, that's, that, that's another thing that I can't quite figure out when that occurred, because obviously during the golden age, we have reconstruction mm -hmm. going on that, that line that I, I claim to be an equator. Right. Um, and of course, sometime between the golden age and now, um, you know, something happened to cause the earth to actually tilt the, the physical mass of it to tilt. Now it could have been, <clears throat> it could have been a, um, it, it could have been, um, uh, you know, the magnetic field of the earth flipping. Mm -hmm. Um, now there's, there's, I, I've thought about the mechanic of this. Um, and if you've ever had, let's say you, you got one of those funny looking tops that you spin and it flips up on its top. Have you ever seen those? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Well, the Earth rotates like that, and it's uh, and it's it's kind of got two rotations. So you have your physical rotation that's being uh, that, that's being powered by the magnetic rotation of the Earth. So you've got the magnetic field that's rotating around like a top. Right. And when the magnetic field flips, you got to think all of the matter that makes up Earth um, being kind of tied to that magnetic field. Everything's kind of in that line. And so when you move the field, the earth is going to want to move with it, but much slower. Right. So, so let's say you've got the magnetic field just completely flips. The, the whole earth isn't going to completely flip with it, but it's going to try to follow it until it slowly, you know, it's, it's just going to take a much longer time for the physical earth to flip. So it's trying to line itself up with that new magnetic field. And before it can, um, all the particles themselves individually will line up to it and then the earth will stop moving. So like I said, it's not like a complete flip of the earth. Right. It's just going to be, like I said, from that six degrees to that 23 and a half degrees. Got it. Okay. So then at that point, um, we have no idea if, if possibly the magnetic field is changing, if it's flipping, if it's stronger, if it's weaker. Um, could that right. have affected the telepathy? Could the magnetic field affect it? 
Um, it could. It could. It also could have been maybe something having to do with what kind of comet it was. I mean, perhaps it had something to do with the comet. Um, it could have had something to do. Um, I know Ben McBrady says that it was just he, he doesn't say what what caused it, but he does say that it was so it was such a violent catastrophe that it caused people to lose their telepathy. Now, I don't know what that means. Right. I, I would imagine that maybe, um, you know, maybe it caused something to happen. Maybe our magnetosphere collapsed and caused some kind of radiation from the sun or other kind of cosmic rays to come in and maybe change our DNA. So like I said before, you know, they would have had their own social classes, right? And, mm -hmm. and the people at the top would have been further underground while the rest of the people, which there probably would have been more of, were closer to the surface. Right. So the people that were closer to the surface were more susceptible to whatever radiation might have caused a DNA change for them to lose that telepathic ability. Hmm. <clears throat> hmm. That's, that's interesting, too. That's interesting. All right, so now you're in what you call to be the, the dark area. So in that, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And, then, and this... Go ahead. And the end of this is actually another meltwater pulse one C, and that was a 98 foot sea level rise. So there's another flood that occurred uh, right after the age of cancer. <clears throat> what caused that? Do you know? Well, after the 8.2 cold event, things popped back up. It started heating up again. Um, so, you know, if we were in the tail of a comet and it caused all kind of dirt and debris and whatever to, to cause the earth to cool again, it was for a short period of time. And then everything bumped right back up to, to getting hot. Hmm. And in the middle of the age of cancer, we have a, 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 a rise in temperature. It's like a small bump that lasted like 100 years. And this would have caused, you know, a lot more. Um, and the way, um, the way Randall Carlson puts it, uh, a lot of these heating periods would create these glacier seas. So you have this big ice of glacier that's two miles high, say, and then all of a sudden you get pooling in the middle of this glacier and it starts to melt and turn into kind of a glacial sea and which is held in by basically ice walls or ice dams. And so it, it starts filling up as it's melting. And then eventually when these ice dams break and me or they melt and break from the pressure, then you get this release of water off the top of these glaciers. Mm. And this is what causes the flooding. Got it. <clears throat> So then now, so you've got, you still, they're still living in the continental <clears throat> shelf area, correct? Um, at this point, they're, they're, they're up in the highlands. They're, they're basically, you know, their homes have been completely destroyed. They're under probably two, 300 feet of water at this point. Okay. So now they're moved up that to that next flatlands, basically mountain area above the continental shelf, right? Yeah. And, and I, I tend to, I, I, what I say is, and part of my theory is that whenever, they discovered that people had lost their telepathic ability. Mm -hmm. I, I started to think about, well, what would have what would have happened? What would have occurred from both sides of the sides of the aisle here? So you've got the people that kept their telepathy, mm -hmm. and they're looking they're looking at the situation, and they're like, okay, this is this is serious. This is scary. What's going on? Is this a disease? Is this a, a DNA change? You know, they're trying to figure out what's happening here. And of course, in doing so, you know, what would we do today? We would have to, you know, we, we would quarantine the people who've lost their ability to try to figure out what happened to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're all living underground in close, I, I assume, somewhat of closed space compared to the surface. Right, right. So if, if things were, you know, relatively okay upstairs, they would have probably stuck these people outside and said, okay, you guys, you know, <laughs> we're, we're going to try to figure this out. You guys stay here. Right. Um, <clears throat> and then... You know, from the perspective of somebody who lost their telepathic ability, you know, they have no ability to speak or, or you know, convey basically anything except, you know, through body language or, um, you know, the, the first generation of these people would have still been able to, uh, um, you know, convey ideas through, say, geometry. They might have still known math. You know, mm -hmm. they would have still been smart. They just couldn't convey their ideas as quickly um, as they used to. And, they, and with no language, they wouldn't be able to convey their ideas. It, it would have been pretty cut off. I mean, today's equivalent would be if you were on a road trip and all of a sudden the GPS satellites and Google went down, you know, mm, right. the whole internet crashes, you're, you're lost. You have no idea what's going on. <clears throat> so that's kind of what happened to them. Um, so from their perspective, they're, they're kind of screwed. And from the perspective of the people who still have their telepathy, you know, they're freaking out. They don't know what's causing it. So the, the safest thing for them to have done 
would have been to stay underground because, you know, it could have been some kind of cosmic radiation changing their DNA. So staying underground would have kept them safe from that. Right. And, and so, and, and when you think about what, you know, what they were thinking is, you know, we've got to fix this problem. How do we fix this? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm sure they did everything they could, but eventually, ultimately, they sent those people to the top. And that's where you get these emergence oral traditions from, say, you know, the Native Americans who talk about, you know, the earth opened in in uh, the Grand Canyon and they all came out. Um, right. Or, you know, in, in um, <clears throat> I want to say, um, what is it, uh, Australia. Yeah, the aboriginals in Australia say they came out of the ground. And uh, you look at some of these other, you know, in ancient Chinese legends, they came from a mountain mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, they talk about in, in ancient Greece, Mount Olymp, you know, it, all these came different places, mountain. whether it be yeah. mountains or underground, they came from. Um, so it, it's clear that they came from underground. And, and these people that came out were the ones that had lost their telepathic ability. Gotcha. All right. So uh, and and. Also, if you can't communicate with somebody and you can't, you know, at this point, it's like, okay, you, you got to go. You know what I mean? Because you, you have no idea what, you know. Well, it's like a, it's like a, basically everybody turned into Helen Keller. You can't, you, right. you can't convey anything. So you, you kind of, those people would have been so frustrated that there might have been some violence involved. Exactly. And that would have been another reason that they had to, you know, send them up to the top. And that's, that's another, that's another thing that I kind of point to in, say, the Adam and Eve story when they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden mm -hmm. and, you know, God placed the, 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 um, the cherubim at the gates to guard the gates. Um, and that's not, you know, isolated to the biblical story. Uh, when you get into some of the Akkadian stories about Sumer and, uh, you know, Gilgamesh going to the cedar forest, which was the entrance way to the underground city of the gods. And in him confronting Humbaba, which was a, you know, a, 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 I guess the story goes, it's like a, a monster of some kind that he had to defeat. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not isolated to the Bible. These are stories from all over the world that are echoing the same thing. So, <laughs> all right. So though, once they get up there, now they can't speak. Language has got to be some type of because you're now you're in a group of people and you all can't speak, so you're all just kind of staring at each other. So, at what is this when language begins to start to evolve? Well, it starts off with them roaming around in in groups. You know, you you would have stuck together because you know the the surface world is now pretty dangerous because humans hadn't been up there for a while. Hmm. Um, you don't know what's going on uh you know obviously at night you got all the predators coming out and you're having to um hold up in caves or whatever you can find for shelter um you know they would have used clicks whistles you know hand gestures you know whatever they could come up with to you convey simple things right and uh you know eventually that culminated i i believe culminated into a, a very primitive language uh spoken language because written language would have come further would have come after that um long after that right at least the written way it's words but i mean pictures and stuff would be first like hey you oh yeah 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 um and that's what we seem to start with with you know like, you know pictures and diagrams and things and what's interesting when you look at this from the astrological perspective and mm -hmm. you're looking at these different ages you've got um you know the age of leo which is the lion the mm -hmm. golden age um which would you know that's another reason that they claim the sphinx was was built back then because they believed that the Sphinx was actually originally a, with a lion's head. You know, it was, it mm. was fa facing the sun in the East whenever, uh, you know, the, um, I believe it's the, uh, uh, spring equinox is when the sun would have been in the, in the sign of Leo during that time. Um, so the, the Sphinx was actually facing the sun when it was in Leo during the age of Leo. And then when you get to the age of cancer, you've got, you know, the, um, you've got another meltwater pulse that happens. Mm -hmm. um, you probably have major flooding and all kinds of stuff from the 8.2 cold event. And when you get into the age of Gemini, we're talking about, you know, if you look at Gemini as the astro astrological sign, it's communication, it's language, it's writing. That's what that sign represents. So during that age is when language was being invented, which I find interesting because this is also the age of uh, the Mesopotamian Ubaid period, which is when they were making pottery. 
Uh, this is when they were kind of figuring out agriculture and figuring out how to kind of uh, pull themselves together into a primitive working society. Um, and this was during the age of Gemini. Yeah. So now, so with the language, you now, of course, you're building from there, you're building hierarchies and like you said, the emerge of society. So now societies are being built around this, the, the language that's now being created. Yeah. And keep in mind that, you know, once the first generation of people, the first generation of people that lost their telepathy, they knew everything, but they couldn't convey it. So when they had kids, you know, there was nothing to hand down. They couldn't hand anything at, down to them. No history, no, no skills, no, you know, nothing. So once those people that once that generation died off, their children were essentially dropped into a Stone Age existence. There was, you know, they they had no idea. They didn't even have any idea about the underground civilizations at this point because they weren't told. Right. So right. they lived, you know, thousands of years not knowing their own history because there was no history to hand down. It, they had to invent language first in order to get the oral tradition started so that they could have, you know, a historical tradition. Hmm. And that's and it's also a good point. Like you know, example would be sundial. So everybody was on the same page at hey, time to start planting. You know what I mean? Right. Things like that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, oh, yeah. it's the passing of that information um, because of you know <laughs> communication barriers. You know. Yeah, and once you get communication, well, now you can teach somebody to do something. Right. Now you can kind of pull people together for a common cause. You can, like I said, start agriculture because that would have been very important. Right. You know, how, how do you plant, when to plant, what to plant, you know, what can you eat, what can't you eat, that sort <laughs> yeah. of thing. You know, that, that couldn't have been conveyed until language came along. Right. Well, it can be conveyed one way, but not a good way. Can't eat that. Okay. Right, gotcha. right. You know, uh, no, no, no. Right. And, and so <laughs> at this point, now it, 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 there's summer, right? Right. And then you, you, the what's what are we looking at for weather is just the same weather we have now, basically? See? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, th there's no way to know for sure. I mean... Um, obviously it would have been pretty close. If we had the earth tilted like we do now, then during the age of Gemini, then it would have been very close to what it is now. Gotcha. Okay. So where, all right. So you've got a uh, merge of society, um, weather patterns that are just kind of the same. And now what's, where are they going from there? Now from here is where it gets really interesting. This is when history starts. So at the end of the Ubaid period of Mesopotamian pottery making and all this stuff, all of a sudden out pops Sumer during the age of Taurus. Mm -hmm. and the age of Taurus represents agriculture. It also represents fertility. So you've got not only agriculture going on, but you've got an explosion in population because of that agriculture. Um, so now you've got... Um, these these primitive civilizations now they're they kind of got their they kind of got things together they're they're getting stuff working and now the population is exploding um and so now they have not only the calories but the 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 manpower to be able to build things right because and 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 this is kind of what so you've got weather to grow and that's kind of why i brought that up and by grow by weather, food can be produced, and food produces more people. When you have, and, and that's just that's you know, if you can, if you throw a bunch of food down, um, and and you'll have more mice show up because they can they'll produce more, knowing that there's more food supply. So that's right. kind of what's going on now is populations and cultures and civil you know societies are saying, okay, we now have enough food to support. Let's go ahead and you know start growing the population. So that's where we're at now. And where does it go kind of from there? Now, this is where it gets interesting and a little confusing. And I've been trying to figure this out um, from reading the Epic of Gilgamesh. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got this primitive society that's got a primitive language, primitive writing. Um, and then all of a sudden you have these... Um, you have Gilgamesh. Now, Gilgamesh isn't the only one. It's just the one that the story was written about. Now, who is, who is Gilgamesh? We're talking about god kings. Okay. Okay, so out, out of this civilization pops these god kings that, that uh, establish dominance over the people who have just um, exploded in population. 
<laughs> and in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, so you've got this underground society with telepathy. They're kind of paying attention to what's going on on the surface. They mm -hmm. see that they figured out agriculture. They're starting to communicate better. Um, you know, maybe we need to go up there and kind of handle things so that things don't get out of hand. Because, you know, without telepathy, there's the ability or let's just say the danger of people taking things the wrong way, uh, <laughs> hidden agendas, <laughs> yeah. um, wars starting, mm -hmm. um, you know, people, point. you know, it, with telepathy, you know, you can't have secrets, you can't hide anything, everything's out in the open, everything's known, um, you know, there's no misunderstandings, that sort of thing. But, the, but without it, of course, there are those dangers. So yeah. they felt that, okay, well, to keep from a war breaking out above and everybody killing each other, maybe we should go up there and kind of, watch over things, maybe steer some policies, maybe maybe create a government for them. Because at this point, they would have been living kind of an egalitarian lifestyle. You know, nobody was really in charge, but, you know, everybody just kind of did their own thing, <clears throat> that sort of thing. But eventually there would have been, you know, the, the um, leaders that would have come out of that and maybe started trouble just because, you know, that, like I said, they don't have that telepathic ability. So there's mm -hmm. things that can happen with that. Um, so you get these um, these god kings in Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian legend, and this also crops up in the Bible, mm -hmm. although it's not apparent in most English translations just because it's very difficult to translate Hebrew to English right. uh, properly. Properly, You can get the message across, but the, the little things here and there get lost in the translation. Um, <clears throat> so in... In the book of Genesis, it talks about, you know, God created this, God created that, and saw right. it was good and all of that. And I got curious one day. Um, I, I, I had studied Hebrew just, just for the sake of being able to translate stuff on my own. Wow. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not adept at it. I'm not, you know, the perfect Hebrew translator, but I, I've listened to all of the, you know, the rabbis talk about certain words and, and all the scholars talk about certain words and how mm -hmm. they're supposed to go and how they think it's supposed to go. And there's this word in the book of Genesis. In fact, it's throughout the Bible called Elohim. And I'm sure, I'm sure, you, I'm sure a lot of people have heard that yeah, word. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that word. Yeah. It is like the most controversial and contested word in the Bible, bar none. Um, if you, I, I've heard what the rabbis say about it. I've heard what the Kabbalists say about it. I've heard what most of the scholars say about it. And, and w once you get that perspective and then try to translate it for yourself, it's very clear what the word means if you take out all of the religious bias, all of the academic bias, and all of that stuff. And the word just means deities. Um, deities. You know, gods. Deities. Gotcha. Gods. And we're not talking about, you know, some ethereal god living in some other dimension or something. We're talking about, you know, the book was written by a group of people who had just escaped Egypt. And if you know anything about Egypt, they had the pharaohs, which were the priest kings, and then right. you had the priests. And they were treated as gods among men because they had knowledge and or abilities that were above your common man. That's why they called them gods. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the when, when you're looking at Genesis and you're translating it and you see this, it reads completely differently than what we've been told. So you've got... Um, you know, Elohim, you know, it talks about, you know, Elohim uh, said, let there be light. Well, that's not what it says. It says that the Elohim witnessed basically the clouds parting and the light shone through and they saw that it was good because uh, essentially what, what the story of Genesis is, it is not the beginning. It is a reconstruction story, just like what we've been talking about, the reconstruction of what happened to Earth. And it talks about the gods. The, these are the, the characters that are in the book of Genesis that are witness to this destruction and this reconstruction. And in fact, it does, it does mention God in some of the, uh, the first chapter, but it's only once. It's when they're sitting there and they're saying, I hope God gives us a place or I hope God makes the, uh, the waters um, rescind so that he can give us a place to live. So it, it, he is mentioned. It's just the other parts where we think he's mentioned. It's talking about a completely different set of characters. And that's these deities. And these deities is, is who I'm saying these telepathic people are. So when you have God kings of Sumer, we're talking about these telepathic people emerging, coming to the surface to try to help these people out. And as as we'll discover, it doesn't quite go as planned. Hmm. 
and that's interesting because a lot of the research I do too is like uh, in, in Korea and ancient Korean and things like that. And a lot of times what they would do is you would be considered a king or, you know, of the gods just by being able to predict the eclipse. Yeah, exactly. That's the so, perfect example. So, you know, next thing you know, it's like, oh, holy crap, you know, and and that the and so now what you're basically saying is saying, look, somewhere at, uh, coming out of the what you call the end of darkness is where you're looking at basically the formation of um, written history of the Bible, and this and the and the telepaths are coming up and basically saying, yeah, here comes the here comes the eclipse. There it goes. It's gone now. I mean, not exactly, but to that to that thing that a lot of the deities are actually what they're talking about, which would could explain why they did so many different things. Well, if you can imagine, if back you know fourteen thousand BC, if they're flying around, you know, we were talking about the Vimanas and the Correct. technology involved. If they still got that, which I imagine they did. You know, maybe they didn't want to scare the people with their technology, so they probably, you know, left that at home and kind of came up on their own. But still, with the telepathic ability and some of their technology, and they probably had some pretty good health care, they, they probably yeah. performed some miracles for these people. And they were like, wow, you know, it would have been easy to do that. And right. And, and even when it comes to look, um, they the what they've seen what they've experienced because we don't know what their life expect is you know um ex how long they would live before they passed away they just predicting the almanac could be you know what i'm saying hey yeah it's going to be low tide here but oh he split the seas well actually it's, it's uh, we knew this was coming i mean that is an aspect of 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 that also correct oh yeah oh yeah and not and not to mention some of the agricultural um let's say uh scientific and agricultural technology that they would have brought with them let's say you know let's say they had uh you know we we can grow a field of wheat mm -hmm. and then these people come along and say well we can show you how to grow a field of wheat that will feed a absolutely everybody it's like we have you know we can we can show you what fertilizer does right. we can show you when to plant your crops you know maybe they didn't have it you know exactly right maybe they were planting in the middle of the summer and didn't get a whole lot of yield and these people helped them out with that and let that alone would consider them superior beings. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. So then uh, you, you go from summer, pronouncing that right, and I'm going to butcher these, um, Akeda? Well, we have um, Sumer was the longest. Sumer, I'm sorry. Sumer, and you'll, you'll discover this when we're talking about the astrological ages, mm -hmm. that there's always a civilization that, that basically stands out in that age. And Sumer stands out in uh, the age of Taurus. Now, towards the end of that, we see kind of a breakup and we see like the Egyptian old kingdom being established. We see Akkadia, the Assyrian Empire, and uh, even the, uh, um, the Xia um, dynasty of China comes in at, at the end of the age of Taurus. So, you know, the, the whole Mesopotamian legends and all of that, that's not an isolated event. You know, these things were happening all over the world. It's just... Our history kind of points to Mesopotamia being where things got started, you know. Right. Uh, but it wasn't isolated. That's just one of the many stories from around the earth. And and <clears throat> just so everybody knows, the Mesopotamia is basically where technology and everything else. Well, I mean, technology began type thing, correct? Well, like I said, it it's, it wasn't an isolated event, but yet yes, well, it for did what happen. we know, for what we know, you know, the, the way yeah, they yeah. push it and and. Yeah. The fact that it was immensely pushed there, but like you were saying, you have so many other societies that might not be, even if Mesopotamia is the fastest one, you have other ones that are also going. Right, right. Right, so there could have been more people here, let's just say, let's just say that there was, in simple numbers, a hundred telepaths here, but there was, you know, 25 over there. So, of course, you've, if you've got that, this area might grow faster, but the other is also growing right right and, and mesopotamia could very well have been you know the uh i guess the largest most significant thing that right. was going on at the time yeah correct you know and and then from there they could so okay so then the, you've got all these dynasties so then you have a agrodegra eruption i'm pronouncing that wrong probably because i um, horrible pronouncing. this is uh this is this is more towards the end of sumer um I wanted to get into the story of Gilgamesh real yes, quick. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, Go ahead. 
So when we're talking about Gilgamesh, um, if it, I, I believe that is an Akkadian name mm-hmm. given to him. I'm not sure if that was actually his real name. But if you look up the definition, well, not definition of his name, but if you look up when, when you're reading the story, you see what he was doing. He was, he was a giant. He was a tyrant. He was a bully, and uh, it. He was also, uh, you know, he went on his his epic to the cedar forest to cut down a tree to bring back to the city of Erech. Now, I, I think that's uh, it's it's important because when we get into the biblical terms, such as the Nephilim, I, I'm sure you've heard yes. of that plenty yeah. of times. Oh yeah. So the definition, the Hebrew definition of Nephilim is a tyrant, a giant, a bully, and a feller of trees. I think I know that. So guy. go ahead. So Gilgamesh was a Nephilim according to you know biblical standards. And mm. when you read the story and kind of have this telepathic mindset and and right. kind of the, this whole view of what was going on, it's almost as if the telepaths thought that okay, well, them not having telepath the telepathic ability, this is this is a danger. We need to try to fix this yeah. now mm-hmm. because they're exploding in population. They're eventually going to go to war with each other, and it's going to cause a lot of chaos. So we need to fix this now. Right. And the only way, in my opinion, the only way they could have done it was by having a breeding program. So what they were trying to do mm-hmm. is get the telepaths to breed with the non-telepaths to create a hybrid race to try to kill off the non-telepathic race of humans. Mm. Okay. So Gilgamesh was part of that. Gilgamesh himself was a hybrid because his mother was a telepath. In fact, in the story, it talks about her interpreting his dreams for him. And she was actually held to a higher standard than his father, who was actually a king. So his father was, wasn't was a god king. He was just a king, so king of men. Mm. Um, so you got his father, who was a king of men, his mother, who was a telepath. Um, they got together and made Gilgamesh, who was a Nephilim. He was, he was the hybrid offspring of those two. So it was a hybrid breeding program that they started. And when you get into the story of Gilgamesh, you'll see that all of the men of Erech were, um, they were enslaved and they were put to work building these ziggurats that you see that are kind of littered around Iraq. And uh, so he enslaved the men and then enslaved the women into this breeding program. And uh, it was called a love rite, right? So it didn't Mm -hmm. matter if they were getting married, didn't matter what. Gilgamesh had his way with them no matter what. Right. And so that's that's what turned him into, you know, basically he was he was uh, tyrannical. And after years, and if you could think this too, um, you know, Gilgamesh was probably also somewhat telepathic, if not a full telepath. I don't know. I mean, it was a hybrid program, so who knows right. what came out of that. But let's just say he had some sort of telepathic ability. He would have known exactly who had who was going to kill him. He knew all of his enemies, so he could get rid of them pretty quick. So he would have reigned for a very long time with no problems whatsoever. And because of this, this would have had this would have uh, you know the population would have had a lot of pent up grievances with this. Mm, yeah, I can see. And that. if if you uh, kind of look at the story of Noah and what was going on during that time, you know that's when we get the story of you know there were giants in those days and and. Uh, um, and also after that, when the the daughter the the sons of of uh, God came under the daughters of men, and uh, you know bear children, which were the Nephilim, and that's what we're talking about right here in in Sumer. This is when this happened. Um, it also talks about the the earth becoming corrupt and wars breaking out and all kinds of chaos going on. So what I think happened was is this pent up grievance turned into a war. So mm. men started having wars with uh, both the Nephilim and, you know, what we would call the gods, the telepaths who are living underground. Um, so what happened to end this was essentially the biblical flood that occurred. And this is where we get into the Agri Doggy eruption, because um, when they talk about where Noah's boat landed, they talk about Mount Ararat, right? Right. In Turkey. Well, the reason why this can't be, there's a lot of different reasons, but uh, if you look into, uh, they call it Agri Dog, Dog, Dogri in uh, 
in uh, Turkish. Mm -hmm. And what this stands for is the fiery mountain. So during this biblical flood, in fact, right before the flood happened, um, this this mountain started erupting. And in fact, if you look on Google Earth right now and you zoom into it, you can actually see all the magma flow that's around this mountain. Um, and this was kind of part of whatever catastrophe happened then, um, which is, you know, just a long list of catastrophes that occurred back then that, that uh, we don't know what the cause of, right. you know, the cause of it was. Um, but, you know, Noah wouldn't have landed his boat on an active volcano. Never. So that's, that's one of the main reasons why he didn't land there. Um, but this flood is what ended this war, um, I believe. Hmm. That's, that's, and when you think about it there and, and you kind of, let's say, throw in a, a, a small piece, other pieces start to fall into place, don't they? Exactly. And, and this isn't isolated either. And in fact, it's not an isolated event in time. Several thousand years later, we hear the story, uh, you know, there's a Native American legend. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the one about where St. Louis sits today used to be a, a massive city of giants that mm -hmm. lived there. Uh, the red-haired giants who were cannibals. Um, and there was, uh, I believe, 10,000 of them that lived in this city where St. Louis sits today. And they would kidnap Native Americans. Um, you know, they, they would uh, uh, kidnap their women and rape them, and they would kidnap the men and eat them. So it was like, it was essentially a, a very violent version of what happened in Sumer. Um, but eventually the Native Americans got together, you know, didn't matter who you were, we're getting together and we're going to, you know, make war with these people. And they did. And they killed 10,000 of them and they burnt their bodies. No, I did not know of that story, actually. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I was actually looking into Native American legends of giants and, and what all was going on back then. And that's one of the legends. I believe it was, um, I'm trying to remember the specific uh, tribes that got together I want to say the Apaches were one of them, but I don't remember for sure. Uh, but there was a, a few tribes that got together and, uh, you know, started a war with them. Hmm. Yeah, that's I did not know that. I did not which know is, that. Which is another reason why you won't find bodies is because they were burning them. They were getting rid of them. Right. Um, but uh, there are a few of those mounds around there that uh, some people have claimed that they are still buried. Some of them are still buried, you know, say before the war, whenever somebody would die, you know, they'd still bury them. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, they're, they're still littered around the United States in these burial mounds and tombs and all kinds of stuff. Um, and we find them every once in a while. But what happens is, is they end up going to the Smithsonian and they disappear. Right. Hmm. Well, then, OK, so then you have the flood and obviously the water rescinds, uh, recedes and you have agriculture again. What, where the, where do you kind of go after the flood now? Because with, with, with everything that's going on. Well, with the flood, you know, that's that's where we get the Epic of Gilgamesh um, and the story of Noah. And I imagine that's also not an isolated event. I'm sure there was a lot of other people that also built boats or, or hid um, in any way they could uh, away from the flood. And there's also we also don't know how large of a scale this flood was. You know, the Bible tells us it was a worldwide flood, but there's right. a lot of, you know, there's a lot of uh, contention against that because, um, you know, a lot of people think it was localized. Some people think it, you know, it wasn't. Um, obviously, there's not enough water to, uh, you know, go all the way up to the top of Mount Everest. So that's right. obviously not not an option. So I imagine it was probably another meltwater pulse, um, although we don't have one in the historical record. So it's possible that it was just a glacial dam that burst somewhere, um, you know, in the northern uh, parts of uh uh, the Middle East, uh, mm -hmm. possibly up in the Russian area. We don't really know. Um, but after that occurred, you know, we kind of have a, a, a new beginning of people, you know, with Noah and his family or whoever it all may have been who may have survived that. And they just kind of continued on with history, essentially. This is, this is kind of where not necessarily the story ends, but where we really pick up with actual written historical records. So, Basically, then, and I'm trying, to, and what I'm trying to do is also keep the timeline so everybody kind of understands the the the, the path of the right. of of the wave. So now, in that after the flood and the written, if you were to pick pick a point on the on the wave, would that you would you know where that point would be? Are we looking at the first top? Are we looking where would you believe it would be? 
Well, let me kind of explain the wave a little further. Yeah. Uh, when we're talking about the wave, whenever um, our solar system, um, if nobody knows, we're, we're going around the Milky Way. <laughs> and as we're going around the Milky Way, um, our solar system kind of does a, a wave up and down mm -hmm. across the plane. So we, uh, as we're going around, we're kind of moving up above the uh, uh, above the ecliptic, and then we move down below the ecliptic, and then right. we move, and it's just a sine wave going all the way around. Um, and what we're talking about with this story is one complete wave um, as we're going around. So uh, at the let's say. The bowling aileron way back at the end of uh, the the Vedic era, mm -hmm. we're talking about um, going up. We're, we're, we're starting at the galactic plane, and now we're moving up in the sine wave. And then as we go through, you know, we get to the age of Leo, and perhaps we're at the top of that. And then once we get to the eight dot two cold event, perhaps that was when we came back through the the uh, galactic plane. And perhaps that's why that event happened. We don't know for sure. And then as we continue, we go into the trough of the wave. And then once Sumer comes around, that's when we're at the trough. We're at the bottom of that wave coming back up to our modern day age right now, where we're coming back up to the, the uh, galactic plane. So this whole history that we're talking about from Scorpio all the way to now is one complete wave um, going up and down through the galactic plane. If that makes sense. Right. Okay. That does. So then there's a lot of different changes that happen, but so you're, we're basically looking at one wave is what our history is and what our is. And that next wave, let's say somewhere around, I think you said 2160 um, starts, could start a whole new chapter Exactly. Of, In of other words, everything. I, I kind of look at, at books like, let's say, the Bible as yeah. being kind of our story of this age. And, and it's not, you know, it's not relegated to that one book. There are other books out there, obviously, that, that, uh, that do this as well mm -hmm. um, from other cultures. Um, but, you know, being from the, the uh, Western culture, that's kind of our book that we look at. Right. Right. Um, and obviously in Eastern cultures, they would have different books that they would look at. But those books are essentially the story of, you know, what's going on in this waveform. Yes. And then the next one, there would probably be another book written of the history of what's go, you know, what, what happens next, you know. Right. Because it's basically the beginning of time is just basically the beginning of the first of the wave. Because <laughs> yeah. it's our time. It's what we're yes, experiencing yes. Um, that eventually will start the wave again. Yeah, and if you look at, uh, you know, also in this this chart of kind of plotted out different empires that have risen and fall, you know, throughout the different ages, and as you go along, you know, you start with Sumer, and then at the end of Sumer, you break off into the Assyrian Empire, Akkadia. Um, when you get into the age of Ares, which represents war, the god of war, uh, the ram, Mm -hmm. The um, uh, the warrior, you get, you know, the Assyrian and Babylonian empires warring against each other. You get the Mayan empire. Uh, a lot of these empires that that relied on their warriors and thought of them as kings, right? You had like right. the uh, the um, King Nimrod, the hunter, and, you know, all of this stuff. It's, it's, it's all part of this whole um, astrological theme when you go throughout these ages. And then, like, when you get to the age of Pisces, you know, Pisces represents, uh, you know, religion, spirituality, things of that nature. That's when you get the Holy Roman Empire that comes onto the stage. And they mm. take up most of that era. Um, you know, they, they sucked up everybody into this one <laughs> empire. Right. And it's only here recently, like, when you look at the chart, you don't realize how short, let's say, the United States has been around. Like, we haven't right. been around that long at no, all. Not, not <laughs> at know? all. Not at all. And, and that's, that confuses people. You know, yeah, it when does. you've got Chinese the, the thousands of years, we've been here 200 and you know, 50, 60, 70 area. You know what I mean? And, and if, if we talk about from the end of Sumer till now, you know, China's been through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve dynasties, and then we get to the Communist Party of China. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, they've been they've been figuring it out for a little bit longer than us. Now and I want to go back to um I know we're our, our time's almost up for this, but I do want to go back. As we the the planet goes through its phases through the Milky Way and stuff like that, it, is it possible that let's just use this as an example? 
passing through something like the Milky Way would be pr- pr- pursued as a, that's probably the wrong word, um, as a comet because of the amount of, you know, stuff that it could be going through. That is a possibility that. Oh, yeah. There, I'm sure there are pockets of, of dust, debris, and yeah. clouds that we go through. Um, you know, uh, I guess one of the things um, that's concerning to a lot of scientists is the Oort cloud that surrounds our solar system that kind of travels with us. And, and I've actually heard uh, some of these people that talk about the, the micronova event as, as saying that's where the Oort cloud came from, is from these mm. micronova event, all this blasting out. And then, you know, that creates, creates chaos in the outer solar system. And then you got rocks colliding and then they might bump back in and come back into the, the solar system and, and cross planets and, and get close to us and, you know, all kinds of stuff. I mean, you, you got to think everything's out in space. Right. <laughs> right. right. And, and so that's also an interesting aspect, like I said. So that's what I meant. You have a lot of things that they construed as we're in a comet when we're actually passing through something that would be, you know, to them would look like some type of comet's tail. Um, because we're passing through, you know, large amounts of space stones and getting, you know, debris and things like that. Oh, yeah. And I imagine I, I have a feeling that the let's say the galactic center or the galactic plane um, has some kind of effect on our sun as far as, you know, maybe it feeds the sun energy. Maybe it takes it away. Maybe it, it, it has some kind of effect, I believe, on the sun whenever we cross the, the galactic plane. There's some kind of energy field that causes the sun to, to go through its changes. That's a good, that's, that's actually a good possibility too, because you're actually moving, you know, things are changing, right? Things are changing. And it's like, Oh no, no, get back in place there, planet earth. Um, and you know, that could be easily something that causes the sun to ramp up or ramp down depending on where we're, we're at. So yeah. I, and, and look, this, these, these are conversations that I wanted to have on this channel to basically put it out there as fringe theory as what if is this a possibility? Because there has been so many fringe theories like Continental Divide that has said, no, no, that's actually real. <laughs> no, that's, that's, yep, that's what happened. Um, and, but it has to start here, right? And uh, it, look, um, this is a lot, again, a uh, second time in a row I've, I've done interviews with you, that this is a tremendous amount of information. So I want to kind of wrap this one up here. And I think we did a good job of covering a lot of it. Um, is there anything you want to throw in that maybe we didn't cover? Actually, I, th- I think we, we sealed this one up pretty good. Perfect. All right. So what I'm going to do here is, uh, any last words you want to jump in? Um, nope. Just looking forward to the next one, actually. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you what, <laughs> I, I want to thank you for coming on again. I want to make this, you know, if not this topic, other topics, but I'd like to have you on, like I said, more and do you guys comment below and let us know what you think, like, or something that you want us to talk about or look into, please comment below because that also kind of fuels us uh, to do more research. You know, he's definitely uh, up there and looking into researching and stuff like that. And I'm just trying to break it all down so everybody can understand it. So we can all start to process this information. So again, I want to thank you for coming on and I'm going to end this one here as always sage out.